this evening to order. We are going to have our city attorney um, state the case. Mr. Chairman, tonight's case is a continuation of case 2018-2004. The original uh, case file is not going to be reread. That's already a matter of record. And in the new case file, which is labeled motion for reconsideration, it has the motion for reconsideration, which was uh, applied for by the applicant, the cover letter that came with that from the applicant's attorney. Uh, legal notice, which was published in the Carroll County Times, certified copies of uh, letters which were sent to the adjoining property owners, a copy of the Carroll County Times paper, which shows the legal notice, a photograph of the hearing notice on the property, and copies of the letters which were sent to the adjoining property owners. As tonight is a continuation, a potential continuation of the case, um, the original case file is included in that record already. We do have some preliminary matters. We have uh, some attorneys present that would like to talk preliminarily to the board about procedural issues regarding the motion for reconsideration. And so what we suggest is that you allow the preliminary matters to be discussed and argued and make a decision on before you get to the actual case presentation, if that's agreeable. All right. So with that, um, the, in the attorney that contacted me first was Mr. Leahy. So Mr. Leahy. Uh, for the record, Jay Brooks Leahy, Delaney Leahy, Curtis and Brophy, Westminster, Maryland. I represent Eagle Oil Company, Inc., which owns the Tawny Town Exxon uh, across the street from the Sheets, which is subject of this application. Um, I have some concerns about the granting of the motion to reconsideration that I'd like to address. And I do have some exhibits, should I have them pre-marked by either the clerk or how do you do that here? If you want to bring them up, we'll mark them for you right here. Very good. I'm giving copies to Schaefer and the attorneys. I have copies for each board member. Great. Um, that's one exhibit. One exhibit, OK. You need copies, you have your own. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. Why don't you take the actual exhibits and you can hand them out? Right, very good. Okay. Everyone up here has one. Yes, I think. Yeah, did you get one more? There's one more. Is this yours? Yes. Mr. Leahy, do you have another one of these? Or did you I do. One? Okay, we'll take one more. Let me make sure I don't give them the one I have my little notes <laughs> exactly. on. Exactly. I think Mr. Farley is sure. of West Thank Minister. you. Okay, motion for reconsideration uh, was filed by the applicant some about 60 days after uh, the decision was made in this case. Uh, your code has no provision for a motion to reconsider um, that I could see. And Our code being the Tony Town Code. The Tony Town Code that okay. relates to the Board of Zoning Appeals, I'm sorry, the Board of Appeals is what you call it, has no provision for a reconsideration. Um, you have the authority to promulgate rules, but I understand that you have not done so, which is not uncommon in small boards like this. Um, but typically, so there's no provision for a motion of reconsideration whatsoever in your code. But what I think is important is what other codes have done that I think can be instructive. So the first exhibit I gave you is from the Carroll County uh, Board of Zoning Appeals Code, from their actual zoning code. And there is one mechanism for a reconsideration which I have highlighted, and that mechanism allows, one has to make sure they got the right glasses on. Uh, that allows an applicant to file a motion to reconsider the approval 
of a Board of Zoning Appeals matter in Carroll County where they put conditions on the approval. And I'm sure you're familiar, you have the authority to put conditions on approvals as well. And that's the limited ability in Carroll County to file a motion of reconsideration. And I think of importance is the fact that it must be filed within 30 days of the written decision. And um, if it's filed, the board in its discretion may uh, hold a hearing, but what they do is they stay in effect. They don't issue their final decision they, they, because you're filing it within 30 days, so they don't issue it and they can consider only on the issue of the conditions. Um, the second exhibit I've presented is actually the rules of order and procedure for the Board of Zoning Appeals for the City of Westminster. They did, they, they like you have the authority to issue rules, they have done so. And the part I've highlighted, section 18, talks about the reconsideration and you will note that written request of a party within 15 days of the decision. Uh, the board may then, within 30 days, grant it. And then I thought the grounds were interesting under section D, page six of what I presented to you. You can, re re con you can have a reconsideration only upon a showing a mistake of fact or law or to correct clerical error or to request a modification of a condition that was granted the discretion of the board for good cause. That's the kind of same thing we had in county. And item three says, no request for hearing shall be granted unless evidence of changed circumstances or new evidence is submitted, which could not reasonably have been presented at the original hearing, or unless some mistake or misrepresentations made. So the grounds are very narrow, and what's interesting about this, I think, or what from a legal point of view is interesting, is that courts place a great bit of weight on the finality of decisions. And that is, once a decision is made by an administrative body or a court of law, there's typically 30 days to file an appeal. And if somebody, if you make a decision and no appeal is filed, it becomes what's called a final non-appealable order. And that's true in courts as well. In, if you have a case in the Circuit Court of Carroll County or any other circuit court and you file a motion for, a, there's a limited time to file a motion for a new hearing or a new trial and it's within, it has to be within 30 days or 15 days. And again, once a judgment becomes final, once a decision of an administrative body or a court becomes final and non-appealable, you know, that is to give protection to all interested parties, including protestants such as my client who protested, who showed up and participated in the hearing in July. Um, and then a final uh, example of how this works is in our appellate rules. The highest courts in the state of Maryland, the Court of Special Appeals and the Court of Appeals, allow for a motion to re for reconsideration to be filed, and um, that is Rule 8605, which Mr. Gulu could look up if he wanted to, but I'll just paraphrase it. Once the Court of Special Appeals or the Court of Appeals issues a written opinion, a litigant can file a motion to reconsideration, but must file it the earlier of before the mandate is issued from the court or 30 <coughs> days from the decision. And again, it's to protect the finale of judgments. Uh, the Court of Special Appeals and the Court of Appeals issue a mandate after they do their, their decision, and sometimes it's 10, 15, 20, 30, even 40 days later. I don't know. I've been in front of the Court of Special Appeals and the Court of Appeals, and the mandate always comes somewhat later. But the mandate is a decision from the appellate court back to the court being appealed from saying, this is our final decision. So again, the same type of situation. Um, so I respectfully submit that um, this decision became final 30 days after it was issued July 30th. It became a final decision, the kind of thing parties should be able to rely on. So I believe it was inappropriate in the end of September when the petitioner uh, filed a request for reconsideration. I think it was improper to have granted that. And so that's why I'm raising this as a preliminary matter. I, I think it should not have been done. And uh, that's all I have. I'm happy to answer questions if any of you would have any. All right. Thank you for your time, sir. Thank you. <coughs>
Good evening. My name is Clark Schaefer, and I'm uh, representing the uh, applicant uh, here today, and I'm the one that uh, filed the motion for reconsideration on the applicant's behalf. Um, we have a basic factual uh, error uh, in uh, Mr. Leahy's argument, which is not his fault. Uh, I assume he just looked at, which he should have done, the board's written decision, which is dated July 30th. But in fact, the decision was not issued till September 10th. Uh, that is when the email uh, from uh, Clara Kalman uh, was sent that says, as promised, attached is the official decision for case number 2018-204, signed by the chairman, Mr. Lee Hand. So in fact, uh, the decision, uh, motion for reconsideration was filed approximately 15 days uh, after that, well within the 30-day period that Mr. Leahy uh, <coughs> argues for. And uh, I'm not going to argue against that 30-day period because I think that's a pretty good argument. Uh, although uh, I find it uh, somewhat unusual uh, to uh, uh, rely on uh, uh, ordinances and regulations which are not <laughs> in effect in the, in, uh, the city of Tawnytown. Nevertheless, I don't need to argue about that. This was a timely filed motion for reconsideration uh, within 15 days, well within the 30-day period that Mr. Leahy argues for. Uh, furthermore, it was uh, placed on the board's official agenda. Uh, if anybody wanted to uh, show up and, uh, and, and argue against it, I was here that night. Um, I think the board would have let them argue against it. Uh, I know they heard from me. It was an open session. So uh, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, uh, an essential uh, factual uh, difference here. Uh, and I have the, e I don't have copies because I wasn't anticipating this argument, but I do have the email chain here that shows that the decision was first published uh, to the applicant on September 10th, 2018 at 9.23 a.m. And I believe uh, Mr. Weeprecht uh, will have that email in his file. Thank you. If I may be heard in response, thank you. Um, Mr. Schaefer makes a good point, if I'm mistaken factually, that in fact the decision, I did see it said July 30th, so I assume that was the correct date. However, my argument still is that the motion to reconsider, even if it now was timely filed, which apparently it was, and I know Mr. Schaefer to be an honest person, so I'm happy to accept that he says that it happened when it happened. But still, that question then becomes, is it appropriate for this body to grant the reconsideration on the information we have before you? And Mr. Schaefer is correct. There is no, you have no rules about it one way or the other. Um, uh, so, Again, there's nothing there, no rules about that, but I think it's helpful to consider what other jurisdictions do. And again, very narrow determinations, at least in Carroll County and Westminster. Uh, and, uh, and in fact, Westminster wouldn't even allow uh, you to get into this because it's really basically putting on testimony that they could have put on back in July or whenever the hearing was, but they, they did not do so. So I would still, uh, granting Mr. Schaefer's uh, argument that my 30-day argument, my strongest argument is no longer there, I still think that it's uh, appropriate not to reconsider. Thank you. <coughs> I'll just say, if I may, that I think it's well within the board's discretion to do what it did, number one, uh, especially because there's no explicit written guidance in your ordinances. And number two, I'll turn the tables on Mr. Leahy and I'll say, where were you? Uh, where was your client to argue against that, this motion for reconsideration when it was brought before the board? Uh, so maybe his time's out. <laughs> Thank you. May I just step forward for a moment and go ahead and say, I appreciate both of you um, sharing. And if you'd like to share after I share, that's totally fine. Um, it, was, it was timely. Um, and at the time, um, at the original hearing, um, we felt that there was um, information could have pre been presented um, by someone who was going to open uh, the business rather than the real estate um, representatives. And so Tawnytown, as our small 
caring, loving town that we are, um, did the reconsideration in good faith that we could get more information this evening. And so that's why we decided to proceed and it was a public um, open affair. Thank you, and I appreciate that, but I think the reality is that my client did not receive any notice of it whatsoever. So to say we could have looked online and known and come in, although I guess technically accurate, is not really realist, realistic about how things happen. The first we knew about it was when we received the notice as an adjoining property owner that this hearing was happening to <coughs> so. Just as an explanation as to why I wasn't here whenever it was you decided. And I recall the issue was traffic flow. Was there something outside of traffic flow that the, your client would like to share? Well, if you decide to go forward with this hearing, we will participate in this okay. re-hearing and if we have some information to present, yes. Okay. <coughs> I would like to proceed with the hearing, the reconsideration. Yeah. What are your thoughts, everybody? So move. Okay. All right. Do we need to so say need a motion? So verbalize this for me. We're going to move on with the hearing that you're going to stand by your reconsideration. Is that what I understand? Well, we yes, we would. Yes, so we will. Yes. So move. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Unanimous yeses. Five. All right. So with that being said, we'll move on with the reconsideration. Um, so the applicant don't necessarily need to go all the details are we looking for a thumbnail sketch yeah I think that the applicant Mr. Schaefer is going to come forward and can present a summary of where we were and then put on new testimony that you feel is relevant and I would imagine the procedural rules will proceed from there is that when you call witnesses we can everyone can have an opportunity to talk to them and then when you're finished we'll take a comment I'm ready to proceed Okay, As a do. housekeeping matter, I think this package was, was part of the application. I'd just like to verify that. <coughs> Let's see. What the next pages look like? Project outlines, yes. Pictures. <clears throat> Mr. Schaefer, it appears the first page, the text, was included in the application, but Not the the, none of the images were. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> when you're finished with your presentation, you can bring that forward. We'll stamp it. For my first, if, if it's okay with the board, I'll just go ahead and call my first witness. <clears throat> sure. Okay, I call Keith Benfer. How do we do this? Does he get up here with this mic? Uh, yes, and he'll sign in up there. Um, and a reminder that anyone who speaks is testifying under oath and are bound by testimony. And I'll remind my witnesses, please speak into the microphone. And if you could sign in if you're testifying so I can get your name right in the opinion. Okay. Yeah, I think it will. You may not be on camera, so you may like that or not like that. So, that's okay. Um, Mr. Benfer, will you uh, uh, tell the board uh, who you are? I'm Keith Benfer. I'm the inspector for Boy License Commissioners, liquor, the liquor board. What, what, were, what was your, a little bit about your background, were you in the law enforcement community? I was a Westminster police officer for the last 23 years. I retired two and a half years ago, and I took over. Um, May of 2016 with the liquor board. And what is your position at the liquor board? I'm the ins chief inspector. And, when, and how long have you been in, in the inspector role at the liquor board? Almost two and a half years. And are you familiar with the, do you go to all the hearings that the liquor board conducts? Yes, I do. Describe generally what your role, what your job is. 
My, my basic job is make sure the liquor stores, restaurants, bars, clubs, all obey by all the liquor laws of Carroll County and the state of Maryland. Did there, did there come a time when, uh, in the recent uh, memory, when uh, Darnista Patel applied uh, to, uh, for a liquor license uh, for a premises known as the Whiskey Barrel in the Tony Town area? Yes, it was the Whiskey Basket. Whiskey Basket, I'm sorry. And uh, were you at that hearing? Yes, I was. Can you tell the board what kind of a process that the board goes through in order to evaluate uh, an application like that? Do they decide whether she's a fit and proper person to hold a liquor license? Yes, they do. Right. Now, generally speaking, what kind of investigation uh, do they undertake uh, before they uh, <coughs> uh, grant a license to somebody like Ms. Patel? Uh, for a transfer of ownership, the owner has to be background checked through the FBI and state fingerprint. Um, they also have their financial disclosure form put in about their financials. They also have to list references. And at the board, the board goes through all the application and this whole packet of information to determine and ask questions if they deem the person is a good person for, to take over the liquor license. Now, th that application package and the financial questionnaire and the police questionnaire, those are all signed under oath and under penalties of perjury by the applicant, are they not? They are, and they're notarized. Right. And then the CJI criminal justice information system uh, is, is tasked uh, with, that, with a fingerprint process, is that correct? Yeah, they have to go down and get fingerprinted through the state. And then those fingerprints are then sent to the various uh, uh, agencies for a report. Is that correct? State, local, and, and federal agencies. And, and that, that information then comes back to the liquor board's file. Is that correct? It, it does correct, yes. Does the liquor board grant uh, or approve uh, such an application based on that information only? No, it's other, that information along with references, financial information, driving record. And then, and then the board also, the Board of License Commissioners, properly known as the Liquor Board, correct? Correct. Um, so I, I'll use those terms because Jim doesn't want to talk about that. Uh, does, does the Liquor um, the Board then hold a publicly advertised hearing? Yes, they do. And at that hearing, it's advertised in the newspaper? Yes, it is. Okay. And anyone can come to that hearing and, and testify uh, in that hearing, is that correct? Yes, they can. And that hearing is. is uh, Witnesses at that hearing are under oath? Yes, they are. Now, and did the board conduct such a hearing regarding Ms. Patel and the whiskey basket? Yes, yes, they did. Right. And did the board uh, eventually uh, decide on that same day that she was a fit and proper person to hold a license? Yes, they did. And they granted the transfer of ownership for the whiskey basket. Now, that hearing had nothing to do with the location we're talking about here today, did it not? It did not. It had only to do with whether she was a fit and proper person to hold a license. Is correct. That correct. Yes. Now, so you're not here today to testify one way or another regarding this location. No. If someone is granted a, a, a liquor, well, let me start that. If if Miss Patel, we now know because we're here tonight, she does want to uh, operate the uh, license at this former sheet store on. On Main Street or, or Baltimore Boulevard in in Tony Town, correct? As far as I know, yes, sir. Right. Um, if she were to, <coughs> to want to do that, she would need not only this board's approval; she would need the, the liquor board's approval, would she not? That's correct. And does that, and that's called a transfer of location, right? Correct. That also involves a public hearing and advertisement, etc. Does it not? Yes, it does. Right. Once somebody starts operating an alcoholic beverage, for instance, a package good store like this one, is there any kind of follow-up inspection or, or regulations that they have to follow in order to comply with uh, the liquor board rules? We do, we do one formal inspection. I also do very various checks throughout their, the year, and we also do age compliance checks where we send an underage volunteer in the attempt to purchase alcohol. And and do you do you currently have an assistant or are you the only special? No, I do have a part-time assistant. Right, so you and your part-time assistant 
covered accounts, correct? That's correct. Okay. Give us an example of some of the things that the liquor board uh, uh, regulates. <coughs> they, regulate, uh, just, just refer to, they regulate sales to minors. Sales to minors. How about sales to an inebriated person? To an intoxicated person, yes, okay. if that's illegal. How about disturbances uh, to the peace? Noise complaints or follow-ups with the, the police department. I'm in constant contact with the local law enforcement to assist them with any noise complaints or any disorderlies or fights that occur at different establishments. Do you have a working a relationship with the police departments in Carroll County? Yes, I do. Right. And so you coordinate, for instance, if there's problems with a, a, a certain location, they'll notify you, correct? Correct, and, yes. And vice versa? Yes. Correct. And does the liquor board have any uh, hammer uh, that they can uh, that they can use in the event uh, somebody is uh, not the, complying with the uh, liquor board regulations and state laws? They can fine up to two thousand dollars per offense. They can also suspend or revoke the license. They could revoke the license. Correct. Thank you. That's all I have for Mr. Becker. <coughs> Sir. May I take Mr. Schaefer's place? I, like him, I'm not photogenic either, so I just assume. Mr. Chairman, how are you doing? Doing good. Uh, this particular application, initially, wasn't this an application for both a transfer of the license and also a transfer of the location? That's correct, it was. So initially, they asked to not only have the license transferred to Ms. Patel, but also to have the location transferred to where the sheets is. That's correct. But they withdrew that transfer request, didn't they? Yes. And so the only thing that happened is that the license was granted to Ms. Patel. Yes. And I think Mr. Schaefer said that, but even if this board grants it, they still can't move that license there. No, they need to have it. They will have a hearing. They need to have a hearing. Okay, that's all I have. Here or there. <clears throat> Anybody in the room have questions <laughs> for Mr. Bennett? I have a question. Is the Whiskey Basket an existing business? Right yes, now? it is. And where is that located? North of of Town on 140. The actual address is 6156 Tony Town Pike. And they've been June 6, 1979, when they were issued their license. So we're moving the whiskey basket, or they want to, to the sheets here. Correct. That whiskey basket will close. No, it was, it's going to have two whiskey baskets. No, that would yeah, that's good. I, yes, they that one would yes that would close. He's going to lose. He he. Mr. Brandon is transferring ownership to Ms. Patel and also closing that license and going to the sheets if. Right. Right. Um, Carroll County is limited with Class A. Licenses, liquor store, packaged goods stores, they're limited to by numbers, by population. Right now, Tonytown has five liquor stores in Tonytown. They're only, they're only allowed three, but they were grandfathered, all five were grandfathered in when they changed the law. So basically, one liquor store for every 5,000 people. Tonytown has five? Yes. So if we grant Pen this, we we'll have six? <coughs> Harvey's General Store, Tonytown. Exxon, Whiskey Basket, and um, my house of liquors. Liquor Barn. I did good. I got four out of five. Have there been any offenses at that location? There was one offense back in June, I mean, September 16th, a violation of sale of minor. And they were fined uh, $300. When you said the fine earlier was? Up to $2,000. And who determines that? The, the board, the three-member board. Is there any strikes they get, or is it just first times 300? First, first times 300. Well, it's an arbitrary number that they could. That's that's the, usually their minimal fines. Um, they have suspended it one, at one time, but most of the time it's $300, and second offense usually doubles. And I'm sorry, when was that? When did they, they did suspend one time. They had one establishment that had never had a fine before, and they did suspend the, the uh, fine. They found guilty, but they suspended the fine. And I don't remember off the top of my head who that was. And Ms. Patel is the only one that has the uh, license. That's correct. 
Any other questions for Mr. Bennett? I have a couple of lighter board questions. Okay. Um, let's let's explain that quota system because it kind of gets confusing. <laughs> when you say twenty ten, you mean the twenty ten election district, do you not? Yes. Not, it's not the city limits. Correct. It's, it's the, the election district. Yes. Now, generally speaking, that quota system is one license per five thousand population in an election district. Is that right? Correct. And the board keeps careful tabs on population, and when new population figures come out. They take that into account, do they not? Yes. And so when you apply that math to the Tawny Town Election District, which is Election District 1, correct? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I okay. believe it's 1. Well, I those of us who do work know it's Election District 1. Yes. So when you apply that to the Tawny Town Election District, you come up with a, uh, I think you said the math works out to 3. 3. Okay. But there's really 5. Correct. Okay, how's that happen? Because they changed the role <coughs> back in 2012, I do believe, is when they changed it, and they put a tighter restriction on it, but they grandfathered all the other, the ones that are, have current liquor license, they grandfathered them in, so we are over. So you Most, had an existing license in good standing on the magic date where they, let, where they enacted the quota system, you were not told, hey, you have to close down. You were said, you were told, okay, you're good, but if you were to vacate or leave, that would just be one less, right? Correct. That creates the market for transfers, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Right. So, in other words, anyone that would want to open a package goods store in the Tawny Town Election District right now would not be able to apply for a new license. Right? That's correct, yes. Uh, they would have to either forget it or they have to purchase an existing license, would they not? Yes. Thank you. That's all. I just want to make that clear. I have a question, if I could. You said that, and I understand this grandfathering business, but you said we had five. Yes. In the Tony Town Electric District. Okay, good enough. And you've listed four. What, where's the fifth one? Penmar, Harvey's, Whiskey Basket, Tony Town Exxon. Liquor Park. Oh, and Liquor, Liquor Park. Park. Okay. That's the one. Penmar's at the You're going to get me one of these days. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's yeah. okay. Yeah. Mr. Okay. Leahy. Two Mark at 194. Yeah. yeah. And. Okay. Thank you. There's 156 establishments in Carroll County. I'm still trying to remember them all. <laughs> That's correct. And that says you get one license for the first 5,000 and one license for every 5,000 thereafter. Now you indicated that the Tony Town Election District has the rights for three licenses. That's cor correct. Okay, now I spoke to the administrator in July when this first came up and at that time, and maybe this has changed, the population she told me in the Tony Town District was 9,880. Has that gone up since then, do you know? I do not know. I do not know. If it was 9,883 in July, that would only be how many licenses? It should be two, but. Two, it, correct. So if it is three, because maybe it's just past over the 10,000, it's barely three. Would you agree with me there? Because maybe Mr. Schaefer has in your more updated version. I, I, just, I just handed Mr. Ben for a. Uh, that doesn't make any sense uh, either. I don't know how current that is, but a printout from the liquor board that has like a data. That's not, it doesn't the seem right either. In the licenses. Well, that says the same. Not, that's 9,892. Right, but that, but that says, quote, it says only one. I don't understand. Well, you know, it says one because it's one or part thereof. You've got to get to the whole five. You have to get to, to 10,001. Okay. 
then I, I should. Yeah. So I'm gonna interject for a minute just to see if I understand what's up. So there are five liquor licenses currently in District One, correct. And the whiskey basket is one of those five, correct. And so we're talking about one of those five just changing location. So we had five, and we'll still have five. So correct. nothing's changing, right? Okay, just making sure. And I, I think I, going by this form, I. The quota of license should be only one for Torrington. I was misspoke when I said, I thought it was three. I would think it's not our place to strip a license, <laughs> so I'm content with saying five is five. Right. We're not here to take anything away. That's not our place. <laughs> All right. I'm sorry about the number. I, oh, I, no, no worries, man. I Thanks. thought it was three, and because I thought it was over. Uh, but the reason that we have this quota is the Carroll County Board of License Commissions decided I do believe so. That that was done before I was hired. Okay. You too. All right. Anybody else have anything for Mr. Bennett? All right. Thank you very much, sir. Okay. Thanks, Chief. Call. Excuse me. Call Jim Williams. Jim, will you state your name and uh, address for the record, please? And please speak into that. My name is Jim Williams. Uh, I live at 7810 West Hill Road, Mount Airy, Maryland, 21771. Jim, uh, where did you, tell, tell the board a little bit about yourself. Where did you grow up? Uh, I grew up in Rockville. Yes, sir. Right. And you talked to, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shorten your name, Darn Patel. Yes, I have. And uh, tell a little, the board a little bit about your uh, background and experience. Where, where did you grow up, Jim? Grew up in Rockville. Uh, sp spent three years in the Army. Uh, got out of the Army, got in the pizza business for about 20 years, and I've been in the liquor business ever since. Now, when you say in the liquor business, tell Um, I owned and operated Skylight Liquors in Elkridge from uh, 1994 to, excuse me, 1992 to 2004. I operated Top Shelf Wine and Spirits uh, in Towson from 2008 through 2013. Now, were they <coughs> Yes, sir, they were. And That is correct. And Top Shelf was in Baltimore County, correct? Right? Yes, sir. So did you go through the licensing process uh, for those counties? Absolutely. Uh, was, it, was it similar to what we described here today? Uh, one was and one wasn't. One we applied for and we got it in Harrod County. Uh, the other one was um, in Baltimore County. We actually purchased the license and transferred it. And were you the uh, owner and operator of both of those businesses? Uh, Skylight Liquors, I was the sole owner uh, and the sole operator in Top Shelf. I was a 40% owner and I was the operator. Now, in Skylight, when, we, when, when I interviewed you, when we talked, I asked you about violations. And you told me you had one violation there, which was sale of cigarettes to a minor. That, that yes, that was my wife. <laughs> Your wife was the minor that bought the cigarettes? No, my wife was the one that sold the cigarettes. It sounds like it. It's your way. <laughs> so, and, and then with Top Shell, uh, you had one violation there, right? Yes, we did. It was my assistant manager. And um, back then, we had scanners. And you just throw the license through the scanner, and it would say, OK. Well, if I look like you, and you looked a little bit like me, and you were 20, and I was 21, 
if I gave you my license, the 20 year old could actually buy alcohol, even though he's only 20. You look at the license, it looks like him, the license is good. The board realized that and they fined us $200. They said that, that was kind of an oversight on their part. All right, and, and other than that, clean operations. Very clean. Now, you've had a chance to, uh, at least from the exterior, look at the, this site, uh, the, 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 sheet, the old sheets building at, uh, on 226 East Baltimore Street, correct? Yes, sir. And uh, what was your first reaction when, uh, when you saw it? I kind of liked it. I love a freestanding building. It's got plenty of parking. Uh, it's a fair, fairly large store. It's not real big. Um, Perfect spot, uh, great access in, great access out. Um, it looks very, very good to me. Right. What else was your reaction? You have another one which was, had to do with the size? Well, I don't understand what you mean. Well, you said it's small. Didn't you? 2,400 is not the perfect size. I mean, 4,000 would probably be better, but uh, uh, Skylight Liquors was 21, uh, Top Shelf was 33. This is 24. I'll make it work. Now, do you plan to be the, uh, uh, the, the manager uh, on site on a regular basis here? Yes, sir. And will you have employees? Absolutely. Do you have an estimate of uh, what kind of employees you need to start? At first, just a few, two to four maybe. Um, after that, hopefully, we'll have 30 or 40. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> now, what do you, what, what, this will be a class A uh, package to We will carry all the craft beers. Craft beer is just taking over the, the world right now. So we will have all our domestic beer naturally. We will have a very nice selection of craft beer. We will have a very nice selection of wines. Uh, as far as alcohol goes, we will have the standard Bacardi, Smirnoffs, and all that, so. Do you anticipate that you'll adjust uh, your inventory as you get familiar with the market? Absolutely. Well, we'll do some wine tastings, obviously. Um, everywhere I've ever been, the two stores I've had, I've had a chiller, which stands about this high. It's got cold water just whipping around constantly. So you take a bottle of wine off the shelf, you stick it in there for two minutes, it's ready to go. People love it. Uh, we will naturally help the ladies out with their 30 packs or anything they can't carry. We'll carry it to the car. We have senior day. We have a ladies' night. Uh, we give discounts to the military. Uh, if you would like something and we don't have it, we'd be more than glad to order it for you and have it in the next day or two. Uh, we will also do gift baskets at <coughs> Thanksgiving, Christmas. Do you believe uh, that uh, this can successfully compete in the ponytail market? Oh, absolutely. Plenty, yes. Absolutely, and I run them out of there as quick as I can get them out of there. They, up in Towson, they'd actually uh, panhandle in front of the store, and we would have to keep running them out and running them out and running them out. Finally, they got the hint, and they went somewhere else. <clears throat> also, do you intend to have a, a, a restroom that would be open to the public that was not patrons of your business? Yes, sir. No, sir. Sorry. <laughs> but you would probably, uh, and I think the code might require, have a restroom that's available for customers, correct? Absolutely. Would your hours of operation be the, at least at first the normal hours of operation for an alcoholic beverage package store? Yeah, I think we'll go 9 to 9 on Monday through Thursday, probably 9 to 10 on Friday and Saturday, and Sunday something like 10 to 7. Yes, sir. Right. You anticipate she'll be on the premises at least at the beginning? I hope so. Yes, she'll be there. And, and you understand she's the one that's, so, so to speak, on the hook with the liquor board as the licensee, correct? 
Absolutely. Do you anticipate that you'll consult with her regarding uh, her policies uh, regarding uh, alcoholic beverage sales, advertisements, etc.? Yes, sir. No, sir. We're just going to clean it up, uh, redo the parking lot, uh, just make it very, uh, very presentable. Now, any, any signage would be similar to the, uh, uh, the, the, the existing, excuse me, the existing sheet signage, correct? Yes, sir. Do you understand that uh, any signage would have to comply with the town code? Absolutely. There's also talk about lighting last time. Do you understand that any lighting would have to Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I do. That's all I have for Mr. Williams. Any questions from up here? Where do you live? Uh, I live in Mount Airy. Yes, sir. Are you currently managing another liquor store? No, ma'am, I'm not. I'm currently working at another liquor store, just part time. But no, uh, it's Sonny's uh, Fine Wine and Liquors in Eldersburg. Okay, so you'll manage the store and Ms. Patel has the license. Yes, ma'am. Anybody in the room have any questions? I have no questions. Huh? <laughs> thank you for your service, Mr. Williams, and the military, and thank you tonight for coming to talk. Thank you very much. So you don't rush me. Yeah, I just, I mean, <laughs> security. It's, well, it is. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm not sure they're fine. I just. Uh, our presentation we we are we're able to or we're available to answer questions if we could and uh if there's any uh further inquiry but for now i had a question for the liquor board gentlemen does carroll county have any uh restrictions on distance from school zones uh, no, uh proximity only for, mic a, only for microbreweries only for micro because we have an elementary school correct uh, Within close proximity of the. Uh, yeah, there is no. There's nothing. No restrictions on that. That's okay. That's the only question. I have. Yeah. <clears throat> Does anybody in attendance this evening have anything new to share that was not shared first time around? I do. I have two witnesses here. Ma, I think you're on the camera or not. Okay. Could you state your name and address, please? Uh, Kenneth Kazmarski, 162 Willis Street, Westminster, Maryland. And what's your connection to the Tawny Town Exxon? I'm the owner of the Tawny Town Exxon. And the Tawny Town Exxon does have a beer and wine and a law sale license? At um, 251 East Baltimore Street Incorporated has has yeah. the beer license. Yes. Yes, it does. In fact, you're a licensee. I'm a licensee. Now, do you believe that if this new liquor store was moved next door to Sheets, whether that would have a negative economic impact on the business? Certainly, it, it, Tawny Town has a limited population. It, I think in, inside the town limits, probably less than 4,000 people would be my guess. Um, and there are limited opportunities to sell. And are there other uh, competitors already Certainly, the liquor barn in the shopping center, uh, and then the, the two 
on 194 going north. <clears throat> um, and, and the whiskey basket has pretty much been a non-entity for a year, two years more. I refer to this. Uh, I have a quick question. Mr. Gasparski, um, how long has the Exxon had the ability to sell liquor? Uh, I've been with Eagle Oil Company since 1980, and prior to our having it, George Zen had, was the licensee for that location, and I don't know how far back it actually goes. It, so at least since 1980. At least okay. since 1980. Thank you. But that's just beer you sell. It, that's just beer, beer, and we do have the opportunity to sell wine. We, we don't sell wine at this point. Okay. Yes, Mr. Shaker. Thank you. Has more of the, uh, actually, this gentleman took my question. So you just sell beer now? Just sell beer. Yeah. What, what, if I went there tonight, uh, how many varieties of beer could I buy? 25, 30. And uh, if I, so if, 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 if I stopped in and wanted to get a, a bottle of Jack Daniels and, a, and six beers, I could not do it at your place, right? The liquor board won't grant me that license for, um, for liquor. Nor can I buy a six pack and a bottle of wine, correct? Um, I don't carry it, no, not at this point. Okay. Did you ever carry it? We have had some light, some um, wines in the past, yes. Which is fine, no market for it? Uh, limited. All right. Do you have any reason to believe that uh, this application, if granted by this board, would cause any adverse effects? Uh, well, certainly it would, would, again, it decreases the, the selling opportunities. Well, I mean, uh, let's strike that. Any adverse effects on the cities, citizens of Pawnee not the individual? Um, it, it just adds to the traffic con congestion on Baltimore Street, um, particularly if you uh, come through anywhere from 3 o'clock till 6 o'clock in the evening. Um, it traffic backs up from 194 almost to the circle. It, um, it, it gets pretty interesting trying to get all, out of some of the properties um, and, and make your way through town. Of course, you, you opposed the sheets when uh, the sheets applied for a special exception uh, many years ago, did you not? I don't recall. I do because I represent the sheets. Okay, I, I may have, I, again, I. Okay. But anyway, um, so do you have any reason to believe this won't be well operated? Um, I don't know the operation. No, can't speak to it. Okay. Not my. Do you have any reason to believe that the liquor board won't be very diligent in enforcing its regulations uh, as it, as uh, as it applies to this uh, this operation? I'm sure they will. In fact, you've had. I've had you've violations. Had, you've had. We had it. To Six, seven violations starting in uh, 1999 and going up to 2015. Yes. All for sales to minors. All for sales to minors. That's all I have. <laughs> Any other questions for the gentleman? All right, thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Uh, Jim Coyle, 418 Hook Road, Westminster, Maryland, owner of the Liquor Barn. And where is the Liquor Barn right now? <coughs> liquor Barn is located at Tony Town Shopping Center. How far is that from the sheets? Uh, approximately a mile and a half, give and, or take. Um, what do you sell for the bar? Uh, beer, wine, liquor. Okay. Full service? Full service. And, um... Uh, lottery, cigarettes. The same thing, yeah. Yeah, what, what they offer. Do you have any reason to believe that if this uh, new store were to move to where the sheets is, whether that would have any negative impact on you economically? Well, definitely, because they're going to do business. They're going to take some business from me, which is going to decrease my employees, you know, because that's the only thing you, you can do. You cut back a little bit. You can't cut back on your rent, your electric. Everything stays the same. You lose employees. 
That's the only thing I worry a little bit about is losing some of my people. They've been with me a long time. Most of them live in Tawny Town. And um, do you believe there's enough business to support a new user in, in Tawny Town across the street from uh, Tawny Town Exxon and involved in the new model of Uh It's going to be tight for all. If that license is granted there, it's going to be tight for everybody because the population just isn't in town. You've got to draw from outside of the town. Hey, I don't want to hear the question. Uh, Mr. Coyle, um, your, your uh, establishment is located in a small shopping center, correct? Correct. And so in order to buy from you, you have to go to the shopping center park and, and come to you, correct? Correct. And you also uh, probably get some business from people that are shopping at other places in that shopping center, correct? Correct. Is your business a lot better when the food store is there? Uh, yes, but we've been able to fight our way back up. Uh, how, how have you done that? Advertising. Different, yeah. different services? Different, like yeah, adding more to the store, expanded the store a little bit, uh, different products, brought in different products to appeal to different people. Well, you, you haven't done any sort of economic studies or anything to, to establish that this is going to hurt your business. You just know that in your gut, right? Yeah. Yeah, but due to the population, you know it's going to affect you. There's only so many people, so many that, people that they deal with. Now, there's a lot of people, uh, I think we just heard from Mr. Kazmarski, and I think there's, there's a lot of people that drive up and down that road, don't they? Correct. I mean, some people think it's too many people. But that's a good thing for somebody that has a business on that road, is it not? In a way, because it all depends if they can get in and out of your business. Do you have any reason to believe that this business will not be well operated? Oh, I have no, no doubt. It'll be well run. And do you have any reason to believe that it that it'll be uh, uh, regulated by the liquor board and watched over for things like sales to minors and that kind of thing? They do a good job of that. Can you experience the connection? Yes, I have. Yes, I have. <laughs> uh, they send you in with a vertical ID. You ask for the ID, and then you refuse to sell if they're under 21, which we don't take any vertical IDs at all. That way it saves us. But we got caught with a vertical, not paying attention to what we were doing. So now we enact it where you got to scan a license into our computer system before we can make a sale to anybody. So you have three, 14, 15, and 16, right? Correct. In the 30 years we've been there. You've been there 30 years? Correct. Have you owned it the whole time? Yes, yes sir. Did you, was, that, was that shopping center, was that new 30 years ago? No. Uh, we purchased from uh, Val Valentine's. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Poole. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Poole? No. Nope. Nope. You all good? <laughs> All right, does that close out witnesses for everybody? Yes, that's all the witnesses that I have. Okay. okay any, anybody uh, public comment? <clears throat> all right, so we can close out. So. <clears throat> um, so, Mr. Leahy, is there a summary you would like to make, or are you good with what's been said? I'm prepared to make a summary. I Mr. Schaefer, sure. Thank you. It's not often that Mr. Leahy lets me go first. Um, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, members of the board, um, interesting case with, a, I think, a little few more twists and turns than your average zoning case, namely the liquor board uh, uh, aspect of it. And I'm, I'll talk a little bit more about why I think that's relevant here. Um, but. I'd like to emphasize that this board uh, has a little different role in government than, for instance, the Planning Commission or even the Mayor and Council, because you're a what's called a quasi-judicial board, <clears throat> meaning partly 
judicial. And what that means in real life is that you are required under law to issue your decisions in a quasi-judicial format, which we've just gone through, which means witnesses under oath, cross-examination allowed, uh, evidence allowed only under the rules of evidence. And most importantly, you're then confined to that record in making your decision. You're not allowed to, to go outside the record and, and say, well, so-and-so told me yesterday that this guy was a bad guy. So I think that's important here because Maryland law, and I think the reason for that is that uh, the law, Maryland law recognizes that we're dealing with property rights here, which is uh, an, an, important, an important thing. And there's a case called Schultz v. Pritz that is the Pritz, it has to do with the Pritz funeral home in Westminster. It's, a, it's the seminal case in Maryland that tells boards of zoning appeals what the rules are in special exception cases. And what it essentially says is that when the legislative body, meaning the mayor and council, when they list alcoholic pa package goods stores as a special exception in a particular zone, and this is your downtown zone, they have made the determination that that use is presumptively compatible with surrounding properties. And that presumption means that in order to defeat or turn down such a use, you're supposed to be, the, the, somebody has to put evidence in front of you showing that there would be adverse effects uh, uh, with the use. Um, uh, you can conjure up a, in, in other words, Pritz was a funeral home. You know, a funeral home was a conditional or special exception use, and they, they wanted to locate it at a certain place. People yelled about traffic, but the, but the Court of Appeals said that just because a funeral home, that it, what it said is every funeral home is going to generate a lot of traffic when someone that's popular, well, that's not the right word, but revered in the community dies. You're going to have a rush of traffic. So you can't turn down these things for an effect like that, that that's associated with every funeral home. This record today that's before you, including uh, the past, which with Randy Bechtel testifying that the, the site met all your technical requirements that are listed in your code, and the record before you simply does not show that this use, if approved, would create adverse effects, and the, the language, forgive me for this, but I have to say it anyway, would create adverse effects above and beyond those inherently associated with such a use, regardless of its location in the zone. That's the Schultz v. Pritz standard. This is in the downtown zone. I know you've heard the argument, so I won't make it a, a, at length, that your downtown zone is replete with uses like this, the sheets, was there prior. These are the kind of uses that fit. The neighborhood, there's no testimony that this would have an adverse effect on the neighborhood. There's no testimony that this will be badly run. And the home, sort of the, the real, um, the, 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 the backup protection here for this use, which is not applicable to all the other uses, almost all the other uses you've listed in your code for downtown business, either principal permitted or special exception. They don't have this. This is a heavily regulated uh, 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 operation. And it's heavily regulated not only through your zoning laws, but through the liquor laws. And the liquor laws have a special inspector hired full time to enforce these laws. So you have a bootstrap here that the town can rely on to not assure, because there's no assurances. I mean, it, you know, yeah, but, but to uh, make it very likely that this will be run in a, 
in a well-mannered way, operated correctly. I think Mr. Williams is uh, quite an impressive uh, manager. You don't, you don't see that much experience uh, in a lot of cases I have uh, where you're, you're getting somebody to run a liquor store, they're, they're new or they're young, um, uh, quite impressive and backed up by the liquor board inspection. So I simply, and, and the, the competition is not a legitimate reason to, to consider. I mean, it's, it's, it's legitimate for these gentlemen to, to make their case. I'm not saying that. Um, and they're, they're watching out for themselves, and I understand that. But, but that is not the kind of adverse effect that the law recognizes as a reason to turn it down. They would have to show that there were some adverse effects other than injury to their, econo their pocketbook or potential uh, injury to their pocketbook uh, that, would, that would show it was negative. So uh, I ask you to consider uh, all the evidence in the record, I know you will, and I, I, I want to thank you for the reconsideration uh, and, and the opportunity to fill in some of the blanks uh, that you uh, 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 cited uh, uh, prior. Uh, I could tell you were um, and, and legitimately uh, uh, concerned about a, a dearth of information about who, what, and when with this place in a key part of your, uh, uh, of your downtown. This will be, if approved, and if we get through the liquor board uh, process, uh, a credit uh, to the town. It'll add economic uh, impact. There'll be some employees. There'll be a lot of sales tax paid. There's a, I learned painfully, I think the, they, they added, a, it's like 9% on liquor. So there'll, there'll be taxes paid. Um, uh, uh, in connection with this, and it will allow a, a, uh, the productive use uh, of a vacant site. It's one of the main goals of zoning, to allow and encourage decent uh, uh, uses of property. So I, I appreciate your time. I ask you to consider the whole record uh, in rendering your decision. And I have one, one item. Um, I appreciate your didactic approach this evening, um, laying out case of precedent. Um, is there anything in Pritz or any other cases in which, um, as a quasi-judicial body, um, we can put um, restrictions in sense of ingress and egress? Because I personally do have a concern, I'm sorry I didn't mention it earlier, um, about that with this property. Um, so are there any cases, let's say, in Westminster Main Street in which um, possibly a, a building that was already established that possibly had uh, two enter exit areas um, on a main street along with the back um, that there were some restraints, let's say one way in and then maybe the back way out. Mediterranean? I'm sorry? Are you, did you talk about a Westminster site or are you just generic? Oh, no, I'm oh. thinking right now about the sheets. Um, my personal concern, um, which, you know, please address or also I don't know if anything's ever been done study-wise um, in Tawnytown, um, the street, I don't know the name of it, that's right next to the Exxon is right across from one of the, um, the west side enter exit of the Sheets property, and then there's an east side which is offset enough where that wouldn't be concerned. So I have been wondering if that could be a one-way ingress and then egress would be out the back to minimize any Main Street issue. So I'm asking, is there any precedent on the Main Street with Westminster that you've dealt with or any of the other many cases that you've dealt with in which there's been um, a, a prudent use of any constraints to a property that had multiple ways to get in and out? It is clear that the board can impose conditions. Yes. Uh, I'm sure your attorney is familiar with that. Um, however, um, and, I, and I understand from the previous hearing that there was a testimony by uh, Councilman Wentz, I think, uh, concerns raised about uh, cut-throughs. I think his, his were more, as I, I, I watched it on YouTube, so I maybe got the whole thing. But it was, cut, it was a cut-through issue, uh, which, you know, we, it's amazing what people will do in the, in the commutes, isn't it? I watch them every morning at 97 and 140. Uh, um, but so my answer to you is yes, I think the board has the authority to pose conditions. Yes. Secondly, I would urge you not to impose uh, such a condition in this case for, for the following reason. There's been no real testimony uh, that 
traffic is an issue here other than the testimony, hey, this is a problem. Um, so there needs to be a justification for it, and especially when you're dealing with an existing commercial site that has existing I ingress, egress. And um, <coughs> I mean, I don't know what else to say except uh, how would you feel, I use this word, how would you feel if you were going to buy a, a nice commercial site with three driveways? And the, the town said, well, just close one of them down. Um, or the, 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 where, and you say, well, why? Well, we, we think it might be an issue. Well, but I don't want to. Access is one of the main attributes of a commercial site is, is access. Um, so I would, I would urge you not to, not to try to shut them down. I, now, we would be willing to do signage uh, and striping to try to uh, prevent uh, the cut-throughs and uh, the right, the, the, the turn stuff, we'd be willing to uh, do that as part of the uh, development of the site. Um, so that didn't, I think it partly answered your question, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so Section 205-74 of your code says, special exceptions are deemed to be a grant of a specific use that would not be appropriate generally or without restriction and shall be based upon a finding that certain conditions governing special exceptions as detailed in this article and the use conforms exist. So, and then 205-76, your standards specifically says that you are, before granting any special exception, the Board of Appeals, you folks, shall find that satisfactory provision and arrangement has been made concerning, but not limited to, the following where applicable. Section B, off-street parking and loading areas where required with particular attention to certain items in subsection A above, and the economic effects on adjoining properties and properties generally in the district. So in fact, your ordinance specifically directs you to look at the economic effects on adjoining property owners, such as Tony Town Exxon, and property owners generally in the vicinity, such as the liquor barn. So that's something you're spe specifically directed to look at. And what I find of interest is that, and who knows the historic reasons, there are already five off-sale packaged goods store type places in the Tawny Town District. And there should be either one or two. So they're already, and I realize this is not gonna add that because they're moving one, but they're moving one from way outside the town into the middle of the town, next door to an existing licensee and within a reasonable distance of another licensee. So yes, this is going to have negative economic impacts, uh, and that is something you're supposed to be looking at. And I think if you look at that uh, and understand what's going on, that, that gives you a basis for denying this application, and we would ask you to do so. Thank you. All righty, thank you, everyone. So we're going to close the public portion. And we'll move on to deliberation. Thoughts? What has been said tonight has not really swayed my initial feeling from the first. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, I, I, I look at this thing and I'm, uh, we're aiding the county in a mistake that they made. We should only have two, not five. But I understand the grandfathering thing as well. But I, I understand we can't say, does the town need this? I don't think it does, but that's not an argument we can make. But uh, certainly it would affect two accounts that have been here for a long, long time. And I don't want to see that happen.
done. I'm done. <coughs> the one thing it did clear up to me was how it's run. That was one major concern I had in the beginning. There was one other minor concern, but that's pretty much a mute point at this time. So got a better understanding how it's operated. <clears throat> that's it. Uh, for me, the first time through, um, there really wasn't any information about how it would be run um, and who would be there. Um, I think there were four individuals in the real estate uh, business that, that were going to be spokespersons. One person showed up and seemed like he was winging it and did not have much to offer. Um, so tonight um, was very thorough in, in terms of uh, what was shared. Um, And based upon the role that we as the BZA, the role that we have, um, I would be inclined to grant it based on everything that was shared this evening. Are any of the potential buyers here? Yes. Mm -hmm. you say, did you say potential buyers? Yes, the yeah. buyers for the property. Yes. Okay. I will grant that I my answer is yes okay so I'm a no okay anybody else have any thoughts yeah, yeah. all right um, well we have do we have a motion uh, to motion. grant the, the the awarding of whiskey basket to that location? I move we approve it. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Um, been moved and seconded. So we'll move on to the voting. All those in favor, say yay. 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 All those opposed, nay. Nay. All right. Carries three to two, and we adjourn. Thank you.